Thank you. All righty. You guys are the best. You have hung in for hour after hour. So now we're going to bring it home with what the heck do we do? What do Christians do in response to these immense cultural and political forces that are pulling at us, that are tugging at us, um, and that are, quite frankly, also pulling and tugging at our own religious liberties, our own ability to speak freely, um, our ability to worship, even our ability in some instances to create and maintain schools like this are under threat. So what is it, what is it that we're going to do? So um, I mentioned earlier that our politics is increasingly moving towards a post-Christian ethic. I mean, you see this all the time. You see this all the time. The deep level of intolerance, the deep levels of anger, the absolute lack of forgiveness, um, the complete abdication of anything remotely resembling a golden rule. Uh, instead, a, a new rule that is essentially says, you know, punch back twice as hard, do unto them worse than they do unto you, uh, where there is no consistent moral ethic, where hypocrisy is the only consistent ethic. I mean, this is what we are seeing time and time again. And I can go through this chapter and verse if you want me to. Um, but, you know, look, let's just get really real here. I'm in front of a, what I would say, I'm, I'm guessing a predominantly evangelical audience. And this is a fact. It is a fact that between, in about a 10-year span of time, coal, uh, moving to its peak in 2016, the American evangelical community went from the community of people most likely to say in response to pollsters that character matters in politicians to the community of people least likely to argue that character matters in politicians. Can't imagine what political developments occurred in 2016 to tempt Christians into arguing that character doesn't matter in politicians, it's all about policy. Um, let's just be really blunt about this. From coming from the political context, the Christian witness right now is being harmed, sometimes seriously, by the perception that American Christianity, especially white American evangelical Protestantism, is inseparably connected to a political movement and a political party that often exhibits the moral awareness of a cockroach. And it often exhibits absolute, actually evil behavior. Actually evil behavior. And this is rationalized, and this is excused, and it's incredibly short-sighted, and it's incredibly fear-filled. So what I'm going to propose today, if we have a post-Christian politics, we need to have a post-political church. Now, I do not mean to say that means don't vote, don't participate in some way. If you feel called into politics, goodness knows we need people who love Jesus Christ, who have a commitment to love and serve their neighbor, who have a commitment to the highest ideals of public service. We need those people. But the fundamental posture of the church towards the world needs to be post-political if politics is post-Christian. Because we cannot intertwine ourselves with these secular political movements that have moved away from and often actively reject and mock, mock Christian ethics and Christian beliefs as a, as a part of the dedication to fight, to fight. So what should we do? Let's just begin with this one statement. Okay, this is going to be a this is going to be a challenging talk, guys. I'm just going to go ahead and warn you. First, stop being afraid. Stop being afraid of the other side. Stop being afraid. 
my goodness, politics is fear motivated. Now, and I just described a lot of ways in which there are movements competing with the Christian worldview that are significant, that are important, that I believe are leading people astray. But what else is new in world history? What else is new? And in the spite of the fact that there were competing religious and political move, uh, mo movements throughout the first century of the church, oppressing the church at a level that we can't comprehend today, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. So stop being afraid. And this is the thing that has got me more and has bothered me more about the evangelical church in the U.S. than anything that I, this is the thing that has bothered me the most. So I grew up, like many of you did, I went to church on Sunday morning, I went to church on Wednesday evening, I went to church on Sunday night, I was in Sunday school, and one of my favorite Sunday school lessons was the lesson of Hezekiah's faith in the face of the Assyrian army. So here's Hezekiah, he's king of Judah right now. You know, when we think of Israel now, we think of like this extraordinarily powerful military entity and the nuclear power, one of the most potent militaries in the, in the world. We don't think of Israel as small and weak anymore. But the kingdom of Judah, which is just sub part of Israel that Hezekiah ruled was small and weak. And it was being beset by the kingdom, by the empire, the Assyrian empire. And the Assyrian army did not comply with the laws of armed conflict. There was no such thing as the laws of armed conflict back in the day. So you have this mighty army bearing down on tiny Judah, King Hezekiah. You all know the story. And look, what do you do? What do you do? In the flesh, what you do is you say, well, here comes one superpower. My only hope is to ally with another superpower, Egypt. Um, that's my hope. Egypt's got some chariots. Maybe they can do something about this Assyrian menace because we sure can't do, we can't do anything about it. This tiny little country can't do anything about it. But Hezekiah's got this guy named Isaiah who's saying, you know, you can't look at it like this. This isn't any kingdom. This isn't any conglomeration of peoples. This isn't any city. This isn't any normal nation. This is the people of God, and the people of God depend on God for their deliverance. They don't trust in chariots. So, Hezekiah, you have to defy everything that your flesh would be telling you to do, something that if there was any other country like the United States of America facing an existential threat, if some pastor said to a president, you know what? Forget NATO. Take this all on your own. You've got this. They'd be impeached. And properly so, because you kind of need allies in the flesh, right? But America isn't Israel. It's not the people of God. So here's a prophet saying to a king of the people of God, trust not in chariots. And Hezekiah listens to what he says. And what happens? The Lord delivered his people. The Lord defeated the Assyrian empire. The Lord defeated the Assyrian army. And the lesson from that always was, who is the primary defender of the people of God? Is it our own flesh? Is it our own blood? Is it our own works? No. No. The Lord preserves and protects his church. Asterisk, except against the threat of Hillary Clinton. <laughs> you see, the Assyrian Empire had nothing on the Clinton political machine. It was far more potent and far much more of an existential threat to the people of God because how do I know that? Because we sure acted like it was, didn't we? Didn't we? Essays like the Flight 93 election that said we have to charge the cockpit or we're going to die I had Christians talk to me during the 2016 election and say, America is over, over, unless Donald Trump wins. Now, I'm not minimizing the stakes of the election. It was serious. It wasn't the most important election of my lifetime. 
I mean, I, what, am, what am I saying? Every election is the most important election of your lifetime. But I knew since every one is the most important in my lifetime, the next one was going to be more important than that one. Um, it, there was this, this strength sense of crisis, of existential threat that said that, you know, everything we believed about the character, the importance and the primacy of character in politicians is, let's just move that aside. Everything that we believe about and, and that the Southern Baptist Convention, its marvelous 1998 statement on the importance of character in public officials, about how the way in which God judges nations, we're going to just move that aside because we're afraid. We're afraid. I had never seen such political fear in my life. And that is not who we are. That is not who we are. That is not who we are called to be. And so what I'm so glad to have a whole hour dedicated to the solution because I feel like I'm partly guilty of creating this fear. Because one of the things that I do is I try to accurately describe threats to religious liberty. So I try to accurately describe here is this movement that's happening that has, could have this potential effect on exercise of religious liberty, liberty. I have this movement that is happening that could have this particular effect on the rights of the unborn. And I try to accurately describe these things. And I fear that what I end up doing is contributing to the atmosphere of fear and an atmosphere of panic that is completely unwarranted and out of proportion not only to the actual threat that we face, but the actual, shall we say, alliance that we have. And the alliance that we have is ultimately not with flesh and blood. It's with the God of the universe, with the God of the universe. And we lack historical perspective. We don't understand how, you know, there, I, I have to confess my envy and resentment towards a colleague named Jonah Goldberg who has this podcast he calls The Remnant, okay? Anyone here listen to The Remnant podcast? You should, it's awesome. Um, but he calls it The Remnant because he feels like those of us who are saying character still matters in, poli in politics, that ideas matter, that um, there are certain truths of, for example, like the broader conservative movement that are, they're true not because they just win at any given election, because they're true that that is a remnant. There's just a remnant left. And I think it's in large ways accurate. I think in many ways it is accurate. And I think back to other remnants in biblical history. So there was the people who had not bowed the knee to Baal, right? Think about that. The whole people of God, the entirety of the people of God who had not bowed the knee to Baal was numbered in the thousands, Thou just the thousands. From, and what a sense of loss from the greatness of King David's time and Solomon's time. Enormous amount of loss. But yet still, God was in control. Think about how, what was the remnant at, the foot, at Jesus' feet at the cross? I mean, what, how many people was that who were still hanging in there? I mean, five? Six? Five or six people, five or six people. That's it. That's it in the universe who were there at the foot of the cross. Man, that's a remnant. That's a remnant. Or how many in the upper room? You know, even after Jesus was resurrected, that's a remnant. And yet we are millions strong in this country millions of faithful, God-fearing, believing people, and we live in a state of fear and panic. It is astonishing when you think about it. It is absolutely astonishing. So number one, we cannot be fearful. That does not mean that we're not prudent, that we're not aware, that we're not shrewd, that we don't oppose what is bad or wrong or evil, but we do not do it from an atmosphere of fear and panic. Just don't. Because what ends up happening is fear and panic yields terrible decision-making. 
when you're petrified, when you're panicked, sometimes you don't speak when you should. Sometimes you make alliances that you should not make. God gave us a spirit of, did not give us a spirit of fear. He did not give us a spirit of fear. So that's rule number one. We have to be, as, and, and ask God, because it doesn't come from our flesh, we have to ask God to, that for the strength to interact with the culture fearlessly and with faith. So that's step one. We have to ask God for the strength to interact with the culture fearlessly and with faith. But that doesn't tell us how to interact with the culture. So the how part is really, really crucial. Because I will tell you this, if you spend any time on Twitter, some of the most fearless people in their interaction with the culture are the biggest jerks. I mean, if you look at online conservatism, much of it is dedicated to owning the libs. It is to being a troll. It is to being deliberately provocative, to try to trigger a reaction so out of bounds that the reaction discredits the actor, or to try to build your own tribe, to try to build your own brand. The online world is actually full, and our politics is actually full of a subset of fearless people who are terrible and who dare do terrible things all the time, who speak in terrible ways and are proud of it. They are happy when they make somebody angry. They are happy when they alienate another person. So this is one aspect of fearlessness that is not of godly courage, okay? You see this so frequently that it's difficult to find models of fearlessness that are, that, that are ex uh, people who, uh, to greater or lesser degrees, because we're all fallen, we all screw up all the time, who do model actual godly courage. And so how do, how do we do that? How do we, how do, we do that? Um, I think of Micah 6.8. I think that, that that verse is a clarion call to the Christian seeking to engage in our culture. So what is Micah 6, 8? What does the Lord require of, man, of you, O man? What is good? It is to seek justice, love, mercy, and to walk humbly for the Lord your God. So those three things, let's break them down. Seek justice. Now, this is the easy part. Everybody's good at that. This is, this is hashtagging. This is indignation. This is, this is wrong. You are wrong. This, this law is wrong. I'm going to fight this law. This movement is wrong. I'm going to fight this movement. That's the seeking justice. We've got that down. A lot of us have that down. We know who to fight. We know what to fight. And now some of you had never heard of intersectionality before this talk are like, down with it. You know, I have a new opponent. It is intersectionality. I'm ready to, ready to roll. And that seeking justice, that's the spirit of our time. The spirit of our time is to rally the troops for the righteous cause. That's the heart of the appeal of intersectionality. It's the power of the righteous cause. So that's the spirit of our time. Rally the troops for the righteous cause. But that's only the first prong of the three prongs. Then we get into loving mercy. Okay, whoa, okay, now it gets complicated. Loving mercy, what does that mean? Well, I, you know, yeah, I think it means a lot of things. I think it means, one of the things it means for me, and I'm, look, everything that I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna go ahead and preemptively confess, I do not always live up to it. Especially the longer I look at Twitter, <laughs> it leads me astray. But this is what I aspire to. So what is loving mercy? Well, for one thing, it, it means viewing a, a human being on the other side of a dispute as a human being is not, and not as a symbol of error and injustice. They're a human being. Our battle is not with flesh and blood. It means extending to another person the kind of mercy and forgiveness you would like extended to you. And we all need it. Extend to another person the kind of mercy and forgiveness you would like extended to you. It means, in my view, doing your darn best to accurately characterize what they believe when you are opposing them. Not to build and torch straw men. Straw man arguments are a form of bearing false witness. 
You are creating something that is false and destroying it. And you are characterizing their views according to your false idea. Even the concept of what's called, this is a great term, nut picking. If you've never heard of nut picking, you now will know how most political discourse is occurring in the US. Nut picking, or a lot of political discourse, nut picking occurs when a controversy erupts and you find some blue check mark on Twitter or some politician in the House or the Senate who says the worst thing, and then you take the worst thing that the other, th other side has said, put it front and center and say, this is what the left really believes. That's nut picking. You see it happen all the time. The left does it to the right, right does it to the left constantly. Like you'll find some obscure like third tier comedian who's really mad, but they've got that blue check mark and they say something about wanting to punch somebody in the face. And then you see it rocket all over conservative Twitter. This is what they really think. So we take the exceptional and we try to make it emblematic. And yet when we have something bad on our side, we say that's exceptional. What's emblematic is the best version of ourselves. And we, you, you find this all the time. Both sides do it in spades. If it's bad on my side, then it's emblematic of what my side really means. If, it's, if it is good on my side, it's exceptional. I mean, that's what the other side would say. And so that battle is constantly occurring. It's called nut picking. It's a great term, I love it, nut picking. And so that's a form of bearing false witness as well. You're taking the worst expression of the opposing point of view and you're combating that as emblematic of the entirety of your opposition. So you're unforgiving, you're nut picking, you're straw manning. This is, I mean, that's basically the how-to guide for like 90% of websites right now. <laughs> straw man, nut pick, and, uh, um, and that's all a form of bearing false witness. So here's what I try to do. I try to read and address the best expression of the opposing side's point of view. Who is making the best argument for the other side? I wanna read that. And I want to address that because if I can address that satisfactorily, not only am I going to build a degree of mutual respect for those people who at least have so somewhat soft hearts on the other side, I'm actually going to have an opportunity to persuade people because I'm going to be dealing with their best rather than dealing with their worst. So I try to pick out the best expression of the opposing side's point of view. That is, I believe, part of loving mercy. Be forgiving, be tolerant, take people as human beings, uh, take on the best expression of the opposing side's point of view. Here's another one, I mentioned it earlier, fight for the rights of others you would like to exercise yourself. So if you see somebody's free speech rights being suppressed and you don't like what they have to say, you can say, I don't like what he has to say, but stop it. Or you can just say, stop it. That actually builds relationships. It actually softens hearts, it happens all the time, but we in this zero sum culture say, if bad person X is not suppressed, he might come back at me, or I don't trust him to be for me. If the roles were reversed, I don't trust him to be for me, so I'm not gonna be for him. I don't care if he's for me or if he's not for me. There's a principle at stake that I support. So that's part of loving mercy. And then finally, there's walking humbly. Boy, I'll tell you this one is, probably the hardest one for many people. We, how many people right now look at complex systems like the climate, like that's, you know, that's a complex scientific system. Here about, here about the, one of the most complex human systems in the US, the relationship between races, the, the historically fraught relationship between races in the United States of America. Um, relationships between nations, religious conflicts in the Middle East. I mean, you name it and says with a degree of humility, you know, here's my best idea, but this is hard. Here's my best idea, but this is hard. And you know what? One of the things that could make my idea better or cause me to abandon my ways, erroneous ways, is if we have a real conversation about it. So here's my idea about our Syria policy but it's hard, let's have a conversation. At the end of it, I may not come out where you are and I may continue to advance my idea, but it's hard. 
you know, look, we have historically Sunday is the most segregated day in America. How do we do that? What do we, how do we fix that? It's really, 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 really hard. But if you come into the public sphere often now with any kind of attitude of humility, you're eaten alive by the bright shining light of certainty. I have the solution. I alone can fix this. I can fix it. I know what to do. And if you disagree with me, not only do you, not only are you wrong, you're probably evil too. Because if you're opposing what's good, doesn't that make you kind of bad? Doesn't that make you bad? And then that's the attitude that we live in today. That's what we marinate in today is the opposite of loving mercy and walking humbly. So, you know, my view is pretty simple. When it comes to combating the religious expression of intersectionality, when it comes to combating religious liberty, I'm not going to shrink one inch away, not one inch, from believing that the Church of Jesus Christ is entitled to, by the, the, the law and the, the founding principle of this, of this country, full protection of the First Amendment. I'm not going to back one inch away from that. I'm not going to back one inch away from the notion that says that as a Christian person working in a corporate context or any other context, I should be every bit as confident to share my views, again, with humility and with mercy, about my fundamental belief systems as somebody who's on a secular progressive is about theirs. That we are equal citizens of this republic, not just politically, but culturally. And I shouldn't be afraid to seek that and to exercise that. And I should not be afraid to support fellow Christians who seek that and who exercise that. I'm not going to back away from that one inch. This is not a call to cultural surrender. I'm not going to back away one inch from advocating for the unborn. But means matter. How you do it matters. Increasingly in this country, I think we have two culture wars that are happening simultaneously. One is the traditional culture war that you see over the outcomes. Are you pro-abortion rights? Are you pro-life? Are you for restricting religious liberty or for, you for greater protections of religious liberty? Time and time again, we see the, this, is, this is the fight we've been fighting for a generation or more. That's there. That's going to be there. But there's also another fight that's emerging, and it's a fight between decent decency and indecency. It is a fight between those who say, you know, look, I may agree or I may disagree with you, but I agree that there are certain rules that govern this country and certain rules that govern the relationships between human beings and certain levels of mutual respect that we should not abandon versus those who say there are no rules, there are only outcomes. And then sneer with contempt as losers Anyone who says, you know, I think there's a rule in the way I interact. There should be a rule in the way that I interact with another human being. Loser. Loser. You just want the left to punch you, punch you in the face and say, thank you, may I have another Mr. Civility Conservative. But there's nothing. The reality is, I think, approaching our culture and approaching our world with an open heart, with an open mind, but also dedication to biblical truth there's nothing, there's nothing fearful about that. I think that's the boldest move. To reject the comforts of tribe in favor of the pursuit of truth, there's nothing fearful about that. That's the boldest move right now. What's comforting are the comforts of tribe. What's comforting is the fellowship of fear. That's what comforting, because that puts you in the company of millions and millions and millions of other people, and it puts you in the middle of a hermetically sealed religious and cultural environment that constantly reinforces your worldview. That's pretty comforting. But that's not where we are supposed to be. And I think that this is an incredibly clarifying time for us. It is a time, I feel like on a day-to-day -day basis, what we as Christians are being confronted with is a test of faith that says, do I, test, do I trust my own flesh? Do I trust my own ability to persuade over the promises of the living God, 
over the truths of Scripture, do I react in panic and fear or do I react in faith and confidence? And not confidence in myself, confidence in my Lord. And I'll end with this before we open up to questions because this part is a little, um, can be a little provocative to people. Um, I also think, I also think a lot of the fearful people are kind of not telling the truth. It's not so much fear as it is a lot of cowardice and rationalization. And here's what I mean. There were people who came to me and they said, because for those of you who don't know, in, in 2016, I was for neither of the major party candidates. And they said, if, if I don't support one candidate over the other, America is over. Our fundamental civil liberties are gone. Our system of government is gone. Our economic system is gone if I don't support one candidate over the other. And for a lot of times, for a long time, I thought, wow, that's pretty panicked. And then I started to say, I don't believe you think that. I just flat out don't believe you think that. I think you're rationalizing. I think you're providing yourself with a pretext. Because is it really true that if the greatest nation in the world, the one that has provided, been a beacon of liberty around the world, the one that has provided you and your family with the blessings of liberty you enjoy nowhere else and the economic opportunity you could enjoy nowhere else, that it's really over, over, is all you're gonna do about it gonna cast a vote? That's all you're gonna do? You're not even gonna like, do a nonviolent protest in the street, you know? You're not even gonna do that. All you're gonna do is cast a vote and then go, oh well, I mean, the nation that almost died at Gettysburg, you know, the nation that sent men to die by the tens of thousands in the Meuse Argonne in 1918, the nation that stormed the beaches in Normandy, the nation that, uh, built Marines so brave that in the chosen reservoir, the Marine general in command surrounded by hundreds, hundreds of thousands of Chinese soldiers said, it's fine, we can attack in any direction we want to. That nation, if the reality TV star didn't win, that's it, that's it for us. Please, you don't believe that, you're rationalizing. And if you think that you have to join a movement that is vicious, that is bigger, bit, bitter, that is spiteful, that is angry, that exhibits none of the fruits of the spirit to save America, you're rationalizing. Because there are other ways. Good Lord. Think about what African Americans faced in the 50s and 60s in the South. What'd they do? Peaceful resistance. Change this country. And we sit there and go, well, man, if our politician doesn't win, if we lose a couple of Supreme Court justices, good grief. I don't think you believe it. I just don't think people believe it. I think they're rationalizing. And they're rationalizing their tribalism. They're rationalizing their compromise. And they're rationalizing ultimately their cowardice. That's what they're rationalizing. When the reality is, look, if a political party if a political leader doesn't meet at least the basics of a commitment to not just the policy outcomes you want, but a commitment to truth, to treating people with a modicum of decency and respect, including their own spouse, nah, no thank you. I'll wait for the next one. I'll wait for the next election because we belong to and are part of something higher and better than that. And if we, if we just devolve into a post-Christian right-wing version of a post-Christian left-wing intersectionality and identity politics, who cares who wins? I mean, really, who cares? Just you say potato, I say potato. I have a friend, uh, a, a, a um, Quain, it's really, I want, I, I, even though he, li he lives in New York, I live in Tennessee, that's why we're not closer friends, but Noah Rothman, he's MSNBC uh, contributor and writes a commentary. He has a really good book out now called in Unjust, basically talking about the rise of the social justice movement. And he says that the counter to it increasingly on the, on the right has become this 
uh, almost a, the, the yin to a yang, a, a sort of a white na nationalist identitarian movement in response to an identitarian movement on the other side. Who cares who wins that? It's both bad. So who are we to be? We're to be the people that we are called to be in scripture. And to the extent that you find yourself engaged in the battle, in the public square, in the marketplace of ideas, and you find that the fruits of the spirit are hard to find, and you find that the fundamental outline, uh, the fundamental outlay and outline for our life in Micah 6, 8 is hard to find, that's when you know you're on the wrong path. That's when you know you've compromised. That's when you know you're full of fear. And that's when you know that there is a need for repentance.